First of all, North Carolina's high school graduation rate is the highest ever, 85.4%. And this is news worth celebrating both for our state's economy and productivity and also for these students and families. And please note that the graduation uh, requirements today are the same as they were when we had much lower graduation rates. 72.2% uh, of the traditional public schools and 70.4% of charter schools received school performance grades of C or better. And I want to congratulate these schools for their performance. And for the first time, we have a new designated designation, A plus NG. And these schools are singled out in the new designation because they earned an A school performance grade. And they also do not have any achievement gaps that are larger than the state's largest achievement gap. And this designation was put in place uh, this year to meet federal requirements regarding our school accountability model. Now when you look behind the letter grades, the measures used to calculate the grades, you will see more information. In reading, our fourth graders showed the largest improvement over the last year's performance with 58.8% scoring at grade level proficiency or better, and that is more than three percentage points higher than last year's performance. And other grades show smaller changes up or down in terms of the percent proficient. And you can see all this information in the executive summary. Uh, I am pleased that mathematics in elementary and middle school showed improvements in the percent proficient at every grade. Uh, we have stayed the course with our standards, and of course that's very critical as we are able to compare our results and to increase our proficiency. Also, uh, science grade 5 and 8 improved in proficiency, and that's also good news. And as with any release of statewide accountability data, we look for areas of concern as well as good news. High school proficiency in biology, English 2, and math dipped slightly when compared to last year's performance. Uh, we continue to be concerned about achievement gaps captured in the annual measure of objectives under the Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And in considering our students who are economically disadvantaged, we continue to be concerned that schools with the highest percent of poverty are also likely to receive grades DRF, even if their students are making healthy gains each year. And of course, this is a very challenging for our teachers who are helping these students make significant growth each year and continue to be labeled in this way. For schools receiving an F grade, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction will evaluate its district and school transformation resources and identify schools where we may provide district assistance to help those schools improve. We have a very positive track record in helping schools to improve. We also note that we continue to need um, preschool education for our students who are economically disadvantaged. And we also need to address the summer reading loss that we see happen year after year after year for our students uh, primarily who live in poverty. And they are very important strategies for this state to improve student achievement, especially in reading. So with that, uh, Dr. Howard and I will be uh, glad to take any of your questions. And Lieutenant Governor uh, Dan Forrest is here also if you have any questions for him. So we'll start here. Uh, Superintendent Atkinson, I'd like to ask you a question and I'd like to ask the Lieutenant Governor to answer the same question. Okay. Uh, I understand you're hitting the high points, the successes, but uh, in Table 1, the thing that really, really matters is getting kids ready to go to college or, or a career afterwards, and uh, you're still stuck at only about a third of the students who are in that category for reading and math. What do you say about that? Well, first of all, uh, I want to uh, note for you that North Carolina received an A in truth-telling about how well our students are doing in comparison to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. 
it was a huge step for North Carolina to raise uh, its standards as far as what would be considered college and career ready and proficient. When we raised standards, both the content standards through the standard course of study, and then subsequent to that, raise the standards for being career and college ready. We said at that time, it will take time for our schools to meet the new requirements. Why did we say that? We have a track record in knowing that when we started with the ABCs, we had very low standards and schools met the challenge. We raised the standards. Uh, we had low proficiency. We raised the standards, and our schools traditionally have met those, those uh, challenges. So it's really important to note that um, we raised the standards. We said to all of you many years ago in 2010, 11, and 12 that we would see a drop in our um, proficiency, and that is what happened. But that does not mean that we shouldn't stay the course for continuing to be a truth teller and for continuing to work where uh, entities such as the United States Chamber of Commerce give us an A in the work that we are doing as far as standards, proficiencies, and truth telling. Okay, you okay. Uh, I'll, well, yeah, reiterate that. I mean, uh, obviously, everybody is constructively discontent with numbers like that. Nobody is. Uh, happy about it. So people are working very hard in DPI and across the districts to improve those numbers and it's, it is now kind of a baseline for us. It was just this past uh, year and Dr. Howard got up and said here are the, here's the definition I think with Dr. Howard of career and college ready, right? We for the first time said okay everybody says we want to be career and college ready. What does that really mean for North Carolina? It's set a baseline definition for that. So now year over year everybody really needs to hold us accountable for improvement on that number. And so, yeah, I mean, nobody nobody should be happy with that number until that number gets closer and closer and closer to 100%. And, but there's a lot of great work going on across the state to achieve those goals. And as we've all said, we want to have the highest standards in the world right here in North Carolina. We want it to, we want it to be tough on our kids. You know, we want to make sure that uh, they are getting the best education they can get in the world right here in North Carolina and prepared for the work that's out there in the workplace. And, and I think you'll start to hear back from the, from the work community as well. I mean, if we're not doing our job, then that, the, the business community is going to start coming to us and saying, hey, you, you didn't live up to your end of the bargain. So I think everybody's trying to live up to that end of the bargain now. Okay. Thank Can you. I follow up? Sure. Go um, ahead, and we'll come to that. When, following up on this question, three years ago when we had the new standards and new tests, you warned everybody the stores are going to drop. But now it seems like we're kind of stuck. Um, there wasn't a lot of movement, save for um, fourth grade reading. So how long will it take for there to be sort of discernible progress? Right. Well, when we go back to look at history, we, we see that that movement is one to two to three points. So it's very similar to the point increase over time. Uh, we anticipate that it would take a really five to six years to be able to see a notable difference. Why? Because when you change standards and you raise standards, then there are some students who are moving through the educational progress, uh, progress where they may have missed some standards that would have been taught earlier. So it typically takes a little while for that to happen. And it's worth noting, too, that those standards were just completely fully rolled out last year. So last year is the first number where all schools, all no. grades were rolled out across the board. Is that correct? No, this uh, three years. Uh, we are in our fourth full year of rolling out all the standards. All standards for right. all grades. Right. right. You'd mentioned uh, possibly targeting some of the F schools or districts for turnaround efforts. I know that those efforts were bolstered a lot by the race to the top funds. I'm wondering if you're concerned about the DPI's ability to effectively use those efforts to turn around these schools without that extra money. Well, we know that our turnaround staff is about half of what it was when we had uh, race to the top dollars. Uh, that means that we will be spreading our resources uh, more thinly, and, but at the same time, we've learned a lot of lessons about what makes the biggest difference in turning around schools. 
So we're optimistic that we can work with the schools. It may be after we analyze these data that we will not work with 118 schools or 120, but we may work with the most difficult uh, or the most challenging schools. And we, we need time to uh, go through the data to make those decisions and then to come back to the state board for its approval of the schools with which we will work most extensively. Uh, another factor is that when we did Race to the Top, we did something different from other states. Other states hired external groups to do the district and school transformation. Our theory of change or action was that we will hire people in North Carolina. We will hire 100 people, uh, master teachers, master principals, to be a part of the department to help local schools turn around. Then, those people are now back in our schools working with other schools. So we anticipate that that will have a multiplier effect also in helping um, make, uh, help our struggling schools. Uh, yes, Don. For, for parents who would look at, this, at these results and really see very little change year to year from last year to this, understanding that this was a compressed evaluation cycle, but still very little change, and if anybody would, were to remember the very press conference that we had after the first round was, re was released, we talked about the poverty, we talked about the underachievement, and we, and, and we heard commitments from you and others to make changes. What would you say to parents? Is it, is it patience? What would you say to parents who were saying, okay, you promised changes, we're seeing the same numbers? Well, first of all, we have to take all these data uh, in perspective. Uh, we have to see these data as a snapshot rather than a movie of the quality of our schools. So that's number one. And all of us have had bad pictures, caught us at the wrong time. Uh, but movies, when you look at the whole of what is happening in our school district, you have to remember that when you look at elementary, we are looking at reading and mathematics and science at one grade. You have arts, you have social studies, you have science at other school, I mean, at other levels. So this is just a snapshot. It doesn't show the entire picture of what a school is doing to educate children well. Now, the graduation rate uh, really is one that summarizes a lot of work. Um, as we said in previous years, um, we do have higher standards. We do have uh, higher proficiency levels for students to reach. Uh, we want to be the truth teller. We want to say that we all need to work higher and we made uh, great strides, but we've got a lot more work to do, as the Lieutenant Governor has said, and uh, we need to continue through work uh, dealing with a digital learning plan where we can actually move faster than what we are today. We know two things are really huge factors. One, preschool education for our most vulnerable children. And two, a different calendar for our schools. Our kids lose two and a half to three months of reading progress every single summer if they go home to a place without books and without adults reading to them. And we have to address those two issues. If we do not address those two issues, we will continue to struggle, especially at the elementary level, to get students reading at grade level. With respect, you might have said the very same thing to me last year when I asked that same question. And I will continue to say that because research backs up that notion. And we as a state have to have the will. If we really want to improve student progress in the state, we have to have the will and the resources to do those two things. I've got to quickly follow them with you, sir, because now we're talking resources. <laughs> Your well, I, uh, I don't hold the checkbook, but uh, I, I try to influence it. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, she's exactly right. I think, you know, when you look at these results, one of the things you really want to look at is poverty and, and the impact that poverty has uh, on these results, and that's where our greatest challenge is. 
in North Carolina are those uh, impoverished districts and schools and places that are below 50% poverty, as you saw in the charts uh, that Dr. Howard rolled out. So what are we going to do about that? And that's one of the reasons that, you know, as I expressed in the meeting and, and have multiple times, that I'm excited about the digital learning plan. I'm excited about bridging the opportunity gap, if you will, in education across the state. It's something that we've talked about for years, and finally we are getting to the place where we have the opportunity. It's for a perfect storm. All the pieces and parts that, that we've been putting together in North Carolina for really decades are coming together to be able to bridge that gap. So those poor students in poor schools will have the same opportunity as the wealthy students in wealthy schools. That's great. Uh, but as Dr. Atkinson said, you know, if you start off in kindergarten and first grade, you've never had a book in your house, you've never read a book, you've never had anybody read to you, you're automatically perhaps years behind at that point. So getting those students on par with those students that have other opportunities, you know, and so we're getting to a place in the history of the world where technology is ubiquitous. You know, it's not just about having a hard a paper uh, book in your house anymore, but ubiquitous technology in the hands of, of these young people who are going to have opportunities to read in different ways and learn in different ways at a very young age. And we need to make sure that we're prepared as a state to deal with that. And, and I think we're moving in that direction. And not to monopolize, but one last quick follow then for you. We, we know we have a surplus, a state surplus. Why wouldn't we spend some of that state surplus if these are critical areas to spend the resources as you're talking about? Why wouldn't we apply some of our surplus to these well, they may. I don't know what's going to happen in the budget. I, I don't know, you know how much of that surplus they're going to hold on to and how much is going to be spent in the budget. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess, in a few days. Are I you think. advocating for that? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's, a, there's always a balance, you know. I mean, I think, yeah, I think you have to work on whatever your priorities are, but you also have to make sure that you put some away for a rainy day because bad things happen and you need to be prepared as a state. So, yeah, it's a mix. It's a combination of all of those things that have to be done. So uh, I think that, you know, you, there's lots of things we have to look at at fund education there's a there's a, a move a whole transition that's going to move here as we move away from uh, you know kind of one pedagogical model of teaching to a whole nother one that's going to transform the funding model around education so all these things have to be considered and and that'll be a part of it and and to the general assembly's credit we have a start with the legislation we need to achieve where we uh, do have funds to provide summer reading camps for our children um, who did not reach proficiency at the third grade. Uh, that needs to be extended to the other grades, kindergarten, first, and second grade. Yes. Um, I think um, most of us have seen numbers in here that show that um, the state um, is paying less per pupil than comparing for inflation that they were than they were in 2008. So I'm just wondering if um, if the goal is to move the needle on, on, on these test scores and yet we're decreasing the funding for student education, like how do you, I guess how do you put those two together? Like how, how, do, you, how do you change the model for funding if, if you're decreasing the amount of per, per people spending? That may be more of a question for you who's going to come here, I'm not sure. Go ahead, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, resources do matter and we know that that dollars available to, to schools to, do, to provide extra help and assistance, to provide more hands and minds in the classrooms to work with students all make a difference. And I believe that it is worth that investment to increase uh, our per pupil expenditure. Uh, it's, it's a part of making sure that every child has a great education when you look at Massachusetts. We see how much money they spend compared to what we spend in North Carolina. And Harvard has recognized North Carolina as getting the biggest bang for its buck uh, for student achievement. So I continue to support our increase in funding, especially for targeted areas where we know that research shows it will make a difference, uh, such as preschool education, such as extended learning during the summer for children. And I would just um, you know, piggyback on that and say uh, that you know, the fallacy in the argument is that all the funding should come from the state. Um, you know, we're seventh in the nation in, in education funding in North Carolina at the state level, which means a lot of our local communities don't put the same amount as they do in other states. Percentage-wise, we're, we're pretty high 
in the nation. And so when you say that the state fund, the funding has dropped for people, that's not just state numbers. That's not just looking at the legislature and the governor and saying, why aren't you doing more? But also looking at our local communities and where does, how does that pan out and what can communities afford? I mean, some communities can afford more than others and the ones that can afford the least are the ones that are really being left behind. And so that's where I think the state has, and the state always has been more engaged at that level. And that's where the state needs to continue to get more engaged. Uh, but again, over the last four years, a billion and a half dollars more put into K-12 education still during a recession. It's not like more money hasn't been put in. Uh, will it be enough? Uh, probably never be enough, really. And we'll have so many programs and things we want to do, it'll never be enough. But you know, you look at New York and New Jersey, they spend a whole lot per pupil, and I, I don't believe they have as good an education system as we do in North Carolina. So as Dr. Atkinson said, it's, it's about bang for the buck as well, and uh, I think North Carolina does a pretty good job of that. Is it enough? No, it never will be. And uh, part of that dilemma is that when all the school districts in North Carolina went bankrupt during the Depression, uh, the state took over the responsibility for funding public education out of the public, uh, out of the general assembly funds. And so there's always that challenge as uh, Lieutenant Governor said, do our communities willing to have higher property taxes versus, uh, such as you would find in New Jersey and other places compared to the dollars coming out of the general fund as it has been the tradition in North Carolina. So uh, that is always a balancing act for funding. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, looking at the growth uh, measures, those have declined, um, and declined in some surprising districts. I'm wondering why you think that might be. Schools that were exceeding um, expectations last year are now not meeting them. Okay. Uh, some of those schools are on the bubble. So they could fall either way. So that's uh, one component. Um, another is that when we look at our elementary schools, we are seeing fewer students coming to uh, kindergarten with the uh, preschool experience. That's another factor. Uh, another factor at the <clears throat> high school and uh, the middle school level is that one time we had dollars to uh, help support children who were not meeting the proficiency standards. So we no longer have those funds to give that extra help and assistance um, to students who are struggling in middle school and high school. And what, what money was that? Uh, we had, uh, at one time, we had an allocation from the General Assembly uh, labeled at-risk funding or accountability funding. And those dollars were appropriated to schools having lower uh, proficiency rates than others. There was a formula used, and we've not had, I can't even remember the last time uh, uh, we had those funds. I think it was in 2008 or 2009 when those funds began to decrease for the state. And I believe in 2010 those funds were eliminated. And, and of course, schools are also dealing with 61,000 more students. Uh, today than we had in 2008-2009. So there's some of the factors. It really is very difficult to name just one reason. There are multiple reasons. Uh, education is complex in that respect. Other questions? I guess yes. uh, as they're negotiating the budget right now, and I'll put this to a question to both of you, is there anything that uh, maybe I won't ask, do you want to see, do you think that we need to see in the budget that's, that's not really out there in, in the current negotiations? I know there were several Democratic lawmakers that held a press conference before today's, uh, today's announcement, and they talked about teacher assistant funding, which I guess is still up for discussion. I guess, just your thoughts on that. Um. I believe that we need four things, and this is without regard of what is already in the budget or not in the budget. Uh, number one, we need to pay our teachers more across the board. Uh, we need to uh, have uh, our teacher assistance. Uh, I visited schools just this week where you see a kindergarten with 20, almost 24 to 25 students in that kindergarten with just one teacher. Um, that would be a challenge. Think about being with 25 or 26 kindergarten students all day without any assistance. So we need to fund our teacher assistance. Uh, we also need, and I'm sure 
uh, to the government will definitely agree with me on this. We need to um, funds for connectivity and for the implementation of our digital plan. Uh, we also need to continue the funding that was started through Read to Achieve. So they are some of the big items from my perspective that we need to stay the course and we need to continue. Um, yeah, I would, you know, I, I think for me the digital learning plan has been kind of number one. We've been spending a lot of time and effort on that and uh, making sure that that funding is in there. So that's been the top priority to us. I have just maybe a difference of opinion of a lot of people. It's just my opinion. So I'm not speaking for anybody in the legislature or the governor or, or Dr. Atkinson or anybody else. But I really feel like there's got to be a time where at the state level from a legislative perspective, we really stop legislating things like teacher's assistance and how many we have and how many we don't have. But give the money to our districts. Uh, where they're dealing with the specific issues that they have to deal with every single day. There's no way we can know them all here at the state. There's no way all the legislators can know them all. And I'd rather see us pass that money on to the districts and let them decide what they do with that funding and whether they hire more teachers or more teachers' assistants or whatever it be. I just think that's a, a local decision and we get caught in the weeds here a lot in Raleigh and spend, this is my perspective again, uh, and Dr. Atkinson, feel free to debate me on it, but I, but I just really feel like we spend too much time in those weeds about numbers that we shouldn't be dealing with. Uh, I certainly agree with Lieutenant Governor that school districts need the flexibility of whether they want to reduce class sizes or hire teacher assistants. Uh, the big idea is that you get the same amount of money, that there is not a decrease. 